copy of our handout today. Normally I say make sure you get one. Today it really doesn't matter because most of the information on it is not correct. <laughs> I say that to you first. I want to begin by saying thank you to all those who helped with our fall festival at City Hall this uh, past week. Those who brought candy, you did awesome. We had, we did great. We had more candy than any other volunteer group there, hands down. We had more candy than anybody else, that was awesome. We had more volunteers there than anybody else did, so y'all did so awesome. It was great. Those who came to bag the candy, thank you so much. You did an absolutely amazing job. And uh, so, good, good, good. All right, um, this past week we had to make some more difficult decisions concerning in-house uh, meetings, Bible studies, and Sunday school as such. Now, as you know, we had hoped to begin Sunday school next Sunday. We had hoped to begin our Wednesday night and Sunday night Bible study and activities on the first of the next month. But in light of uh, more cases, in light of um, what's going on in several of the other local churches around us, uh, we have made the decision to postpone Sunday school and our Sunday night and Wednesday night activities. Um, we're, we are trying and hoping to be able to get those things going as soon as possible. But obviously our church family's safety is utmost and um, so thank you for continuing to pray for wisdom and guidance. Um, folks still, we've been blessed in that um, the virus has had such a little impact in our church family. We're grateful for that. Uh, but we will be postponing Sunday school, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Um, and uh, we're not setting a date as, as such for it yet. Um, just going to continue to play it week by week, month by month. So um, thank you. Do want to share circle meeting, ladies, though. You are going to meet next Monday morning, a week from uh, tomorrow. So ladies, circle meeting, it is going to be a work day for you. So 10 o'clock for circle, mission circle, ladies, on Monday the 26th. Also, when our service is over today, our shoebox ministry store will be open once again. You can pack a shoebox or take a shoebox, get some of the items, pack it with other things yourself. But uh, that will be open when the service is over today. Our Challenger Circle also will not be hosting our normal senior adult Thanksgiving banquet this year. But we will be distributing baskets. Our ACT teams are going to be working on some of those baskets today. But they'll be distributing baskets as well. Ms. Brenda. Yes, thank you, Brenda. If you know somebody that you know could use a Thanksgiving basket, it would be a blessing for them. Please get their name and address to us so that we can get those out to the folks that have the greatest need for those. And uh, so several things that are going on. Again, um, you can ignore much of what is on our weekly handout since several of those things have changed since we printed it uh, the middle of this past week. So continue to pray for us. Continue to pray for God's wisdom and God's leading. We are grateful for your faithfulness to our church and to the Lord through all of this. And uh, we are just blessed in spite of everything that is going on. We do want to take some time to welcome those who might be visiting with us today. I haven't seen anybody that I don't really recognize this morning. So we're going to give you an opportunity to welcome and greet one another this morning. You can stand up with a smile on your face. If you're comfortable with a physical greeting, that's fine. If you're not, that's perfectly fine. Wave um, and uh, do a fist bump or whatever. But let's share a walking song together. Father, we're blessed to be in your house this morning. Thank you for your presence here in this place today. 
We've come to worship you. And I know, Lord, it can be difficult to put aside all the things that are going on in our lives. And to try to put them in the background and put you in the front. To focus on you. To spend time thinking about you. Remembering your blessings. Your faithfulness to us. Your faithfulness to our church family during these difficult days. Your faithfulness in the families and individuals inside our church. We love you. And I pray that the attitudes of our hearts this morning will reflect that as we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in praise this morning. Amen. We're going to sing Ferris, Lord Jesus. It's been a long time since we've sang that. shines purer than all the angels them can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of all nations, Son of God and Son
don't know what your Egypt is this morning. We all have different Egypts. And uh, all I know is there is a God who will fight for you, and he's, he's, he'll bring you out. Amen.
God who fights for me. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Kings once again, and chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. This morning we'll be looking at verses 15 through 27. Our message this morning also in the form of a question as we have been looking at some of life's questions and life's lessons as are taught through some of the stories of the Old Testament Israelites. Today's message entitled, What's in Your Heart? 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 15, and when you find that place in your copy of God's Word, are able to look on with somebody this morning, I would invite you, as we are accustomed to doing, I would invite you to bow your head in reverence to God's word this morning. And as we prepare to read it, I'd invite you to bow your heart before God and take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments of quiet meditation, then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text this morning. Father, it seems that as we gather this morning that sometimes it feels like we are in the land of Egypt, or perhaps like the Israelites who are wandering in the wilderness. And for some, life seems to not have a purpose, for some, a lack of direction. But I'm grateful that we get to open your word this morning because it is a light unto our path. It is a lamp unto our feet. And it is through your precious and holy word that we know how to live and how to act and where to go, what decisions to make. And I pray you'd bless the time that we have in it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What's in your heart? 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 15, the Bible says, And Naaman returned to the man of God, he and all of his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all of the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray you, take a blessing from your servant. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, Shall there then, I pray thee, be given to your servant two mules' burden of earth? For thy servant will now neither offer burnt offerings nor sacrifice to any other gods, only unto Jehovah. And in this thing that Jehovah would pardon thy servant, that when my master, the king of Syria, goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, that when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, that the Lord Jehovah will pardon his servant in, his, in this thing. And Elisha said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian and not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he alighted from the chariot to meet him, and he said, Is all well? And Gehazi said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, there are now two that have come to him from Mount Ephraim, 
two young men, the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray you, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Haman said, oh, be content, take two talents. He urged him to, and he bound the two talents of silver in two bags and the two changes of garments, and he laid them upon two of his servants, and they bore them or carried them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand, and he hid them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. But Gehazi went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, From where are you coming, Gehazi? He said, I didn't go here or there. And Elisha said unto him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and garments, olive yards, vineyards, sheep, oxen, men servants, and maid servants? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman will cling to you and your seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Some of life's questions that we have looked at in the past several weeks, taken from some of the lessons from the Israelite nation in the Old Testament. Questions like, how much is it? Are you blind? Last week, our question was, how do I look. And we looked at the first half of this chapter last week, the story about Naaman, the general for the Syrian army, one of Israel's enemies, who had gone into Israel, captured a girl as part of the prisoner of war, taken her back to Syria, and she is a servant in his house. Naaman, we learned last week, an honorable man, a military general, but he had leprosy. The girl that was taken captive from her home back to Syria mentioned and said if he could only get to the prophet that is in Israel, God could heal him. And of course, the king of Syria sent Naaman and gifts and others to the king of Israel the king of Israel then sent him to Elisha. He came to Elisha's house. Elisha told him, go and dip in the Jordan River several to seven times and you will be healed. Of course, Naaman got angry. You'll remember from last week, if you weren't here last week, you go back and read the first half of that chapter. Naaman got angry, turned around to leave. His servants said to him, wouldn't you do some heroic thing if he'd asked you to do that? And he finally submitted. He went to the Jordan River. He dipped seven times. God healed him of his leprosy, and then our story today, he comes back to the house of Elisha, and we learn today that the story didn't end with him simply returning, but now the story of Elisha's servant Gehazi, so there are four more questions for you today. I know if you were here last week, that's less than half as many as you had last week. Four questions today about your heart, my heart. Question one, is there room for pride? Question two, is there room for coveting? Question three, is there room for lying? And question four, is there room for repentance? In verses 15 and 16, we see the question, is there room for pride in your heart? Naaman is cured. He returns to Elisha, and in verse 15, you notice that he came and stood before him. We shared that's a key phrase, one of the phrases that is repeated in the story several times. In this case, it is the picture, a military picture, Naaman being a general. And if you are in the military, you know that if someone has a superior rank to you and they come into the room... You show respect and you stand at attention. It's a sign of respect. And this time we find Naaman standing before Elisha. It is a unique principle that you probably have missed 
in reading the story before. I know I had. And now we find Naaman standing in respect before Elisha. And he even mentions, I am your servant. Remember, that's a, quite a change from the first part of the story when Naaman came and was very angry that Elisha didn't come out himself but sent one of his servants. Now he stands and says, I am your servant. By the way, here's a key truth for you and I as believers. One of the real signs of a changed heart is humility. One of the genuine signs of a changed heart is humility. And I love Elisha's response. If you notice it in the text and you're already keyed in on the phrase, he stood before him knowing that he was showing respect to Elisha, Elisha then says, you may be standing before me, but in that verse he says, I stand before God. Naaman is signifying that you are the top man. And Elisha says, not me. You show respect to me, I show it to God. How do you look when you stand before God? How will you look when you stand before God? At the time of your death or if Christ comes back, how will you look when you stand before God? Are you confident? I am. I'm not confident from a standpoint that I'll be able to stand before him and tell him that I have lived a life of perfection and ultimate humility and sinlessness but I am going to be able to be confident when I stand before God because God said if when I stand before him, I come with Jesus Christ, I can have that confidence that I'm going to spend eternity with God in heaven. And if you're willing to come God's way through Christ, you can have the confidence that when you stand before God, God's going to say, you're welcome to come to heaven. You're not going to make it there on your own. You're not going to make it there as a church member. You're not going to make it there by doing good works, but you can make it only through Christ. And if you're not sure whether you're a believer today, if you're not sure whether God's going to allow you to come to heaven, you can know that. If you're willing to tell God you're a sinner and tell him you're sorry for your sin, and you're willing to trust Jesus Christ as the way to heaven and give him your life, God will forgive your sin, all of it adopt you, and when you stand before him, he will welcome you as his child to heaven. If you don't know that but would like to or you'd like to know more about it, at the end of our service today, we'll have an invitation and invite folks to come to the front and pray about different things. I'll be standing right here. I would love to talk to you about your faith. If you're not sure, give us that opportunity. Is there room in your heart for pride? Second one is, is there room in your heart for coveting? Naaman offers the extravagant gifts that he has brought to give to Elisha. And of course, Elisha says, I will not receive them. But in verse 17, we find a really unique question or request in the Bible. As you read the story, you probably thought, wait, what, what did Naaman just ask? Naaman asks Elisha, he said, then, if you won't receive this, is there, is there something that, that you will do for me that I'd like to have? And he says, I'd like to have two loads of dirt. I'd like to have two mules carry each one a load of dirt back with me. Now, I don't know about you, that's not something I would ask for. I don't really care about dirt. But he asked for two loads of dirt, and then he tells us why. Because he tells Elisha, when I get back to my country, I know that my king worships the god Rimmon. And I know that as his general, I am going to be expected to go to the idol's place. And I'm going to be expected to kneel down on their ground and worship Rimmon. And I'd like to bring some dirt back that I can put it on the ground so that when I get on the ground, 
I'm on my own sacred ground to Lord Jehovah, and I'm not praying to Rimmon, but I'm praying to Jehovah. Now, you and I would look at that, and because we would say, why not just make the commitment? He says, will God pardon me this when I go and I kneel down, even though it's in an idol's house? Will God pardon me in this? You see, Naaman's had a change of heart. But Naaman's not willing to be a martyr yet. Naaman's had a change of heart. But he also realizes that when he gets back to his country, if he doesn't worship the idol Rimmon, most likely the first thing that's going to happen to him is he is going to lose his job. So imagine being asked to make a commitment today that cost you deeply, financially. And then add to it the fact that it could cost him his life for not bowing down. And so he says, when I go into the house, I'd like to kneel down on some dirt from here and pray to Jehovah, even though it may not appear that way to anybody else. And I know what you're thinking, because you're thinking the same thing I thought when I read the scripture, and that is, what a hypocrite. But don't judge him. Don't judge him quite yet. Because one, he's already beginning to learn the lesson that there's a difference between what's in your heart and what appears to be on the outside. And if you come to church today in God's place and you and I go through all the motions of church but we're not as genuine in our heart about it, I believe we're not like Naaman, I believe we're worse. Because in all likelihood, it's not going to cost you your job or income by going to church and worshiping God. And it's very unlikely it's going to cost you your life. Naaman asks for some dirt. <laughs> and so he loads up two loads of dirt and pfft, they head back. And of course, in our story today, we know that Gehazi, Elisha's servant, goes, wait, 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 wait a second. The man came with some serious, very expensive, and a large amount of gifts for Elisha, and Elisha didn't take him, and so in verse 20, Gehazi says, I'm going to run after him, and I will receive the gifts. By the way, notice in verse 20, one of the very damaging things to Gehazi is he has the audacity to do something that is wrong and even invoke as the Lord liveth. You ever had somebody who you were standing next to and they said something that you might think of as blasphemy or you went like, you know that picture of I'm getting away in case God strikes you dead with lightning? As the Lord lives. Um, you're only qualified to judge him in that if there is zero hypocrisy in your heart this morning. Zero. As the Lord lives, I'll go after him. And of course, Gehazi tries to justify his sin. He comes back and he says, well, you know, he already had it. It's not costing him anything. He has plenty and even so much as employs that I think God would want me to have this. Ooh, we know the rest of the story and know that Gehazi is already in deep trouble. But we're already seeing Gehazi's heart. So he runs after him. And then verse 22, when he finally gets near them, 
Naaman and his host turn around and they see Gehazi running after him, so they stop. Gehazi gets, or Naaman gets off of his chariot and he meets Gehazi there in verse 22. Now I want you to notice what begins. How many here have ever told a lie? Okay, if you did not raise your hand, you just did your first one, I think. What often happens when you tell somebody a lie? You've got to tell another lie to cover up the lie that you told, and then you've got to tell another lie to cover up the lie you told to cover up the lie. You can dig into it and find how many lies Gehazi comes up with, but let's look at several of them. Verse 22, Naaman asks, is all well? Ain't lie number one. Yes, all is well. Well, I know what you're thinking. If you're like me, you're going, well, technically it is. Technically, I'm not really lying because all is well. But you and I know that all's not well with Gehazi's heart. So Gehazi lies, number one. Number two, my master sent me. Well, you and I have read the story. We know that's not true. All's not well. My master sent me. Now the lies get even better. Two sons of the prophets came just after you left. And they have a need. Lie like three, four, five. Here's another lie. Took me going through it twice to catch this one. Look there in verse 22. Give them. Did you catch that one? Give them. Uh, who's going to get it? Gehazi is going to get it. Another lie. It's for them, not for me. And that brings us to our third point today. We can already see Gehazi lying. And I know that all of us would condemn lying if I asked you to raise your hand. How many think lying's wrong? We'd, you know, we'd all raise our hand and go, lying's wrong. But then if I would ask you, did you tell any part of an untruth this past week? So is there any room for lying? Any room for pride in your heart? Any? A little bit? A lot? Any room for coveting? Any room for lying? Huh. In verse 23, Naaman, wa Naaman wants to give it all to him. And you can tell by the conversation that he wants to give it all to him. And apparently Gehazi says, no, not everything. And then Naaman urges him and says, no, everything. Take two. Not the one, but we brought two talent. Bring, take two. And so Gehazi agrees to it. But I want you to notice something. All the while that Gehazi is running after Naaman... He has an opportunity to stop at any time and say, this is wrong, I can't do it. When he reaches Naaman, and Naaman gets off his chariot and walks back to him, he's got another opportunity to stop right then. When Naaman says, no, don't take just one, but take two of the talents. Take two of the loads and bags of money with you. He's got another opportunity to go, I've got to stop this right here. I have to stop this right here. I can't do that. And he urges him, and Gehazi still takes it. Now, notice in verse 23, the load is so great that Gehazi can't carry all of it back himself. So Naaman sends two of his servants, each with a load of silver and garment, and they begin the walk back. All the while, Gehazi still has what opportunity? Stop. Turn around. End it. But he continues to walk back home. And I want you to notice that the text tells us that they bore the gifts in front of him on the way. It's really a unique play on words there for you and I to remember. 
You guess where Gehazi's eyes are? He is looking at what's on the back of those two servants. And we know from the end of the story, he's already thinking about what he's going to use it for. And Gehazi is one lie after another. Then they get to the house, the tower, in verse 24. A tower, as you understand, we're going to learn about the city of Samaria. The city of Samaria, you remember, is a very walled, fortified city. It's on a hill. All of the vegetation around it has been cut down, we know from subsequent stories about Samaria and the capital city that it was. But stationed miles away from Samaria, where a sentry or guard could be on top of the wall of Samaria, there were towers set up out in the distance. And there would be a sentry on one of those towers. And that sentry would be able to watch for the army that might be coming. And they could then relay from that tower to the next tower and back to Samaria, the enemy is coming. And so as they, re as they approach home... Gehazi is already thinking, what am I going to do? I can't walk into the house with Elisha with two servants carrying great bags full of silver and garments. And so we know there that he hides them in a house there. Now the question number four. We've already talked about it and introduced it. Is there room for repentance? How many opportunities has Gehazi had to stop and change from the moment he first walked out the door, running all the way to Naaman? When Naaman stops, the walk back, at any time he's telling the lies, he could stop. Now he's hidden the treasure in a house. But I want you to know that he still has an opportunity to repent. If you don't get anything outside of the sermon today, get that. That regardless of what your life has been like this last week, you know what your heart looks like with pride. You know what your heart looks like coveting, believing that something or someone will bring you happiness. You know what your life looks like and your heart looks like with lying. But there's still an opportunity for repentance. God is patient. God is long-suffering, and I am, I am so grateful that he is. And while he has an infinite amount of patience... He doesn't infinitely apply patience to us. And at some point, you come to the last opportunity to make it right. Today might be your last opportunity to make your standing before God right. You may not have another opportunity. As a child of God, today may be your last warning before God has to bring judgment. So, he walks in to Elisha, verse 25. Wait, don't. Check this out. I told you about some of the key phrases like, as the Lord liveth. The key phrase in the whole story, and went and stood before him. Remember what that means? You're showing respect to the person you're standing before. Notice what Gehazi does in verse 25. He went in, and he stood before Elisha. Don't miss it. Because that might be you right here in church this morning. When he went in and stood before Elisha, 
It was the picture on the outside of respect and honor. But we know what was on the inside of Gehazi's heart. There was not respect or honor. There was pride. There was coveting. There was lying. But he goes in with all the appearance of standing before Elisha. I know that that scene spiritually is being repeated in churches all around the country right now. Even here. On the outside, we want folks to think we're giving honor to God, but on the inside, there's still some lying. There's still some pride. There's still some coveting. And he stands before him, and he has another opportunity to stop. Of course, we know what uh, Elisha says. Uh, Elisha says, uh, where did you go? Verse 25. <laughs> Anybody here wonder how difficult it would be to be, uh, to be Gehazi right then? You know the question of where did you go? Um, I've been there. I've been there. Years ago, I shared a story about growing up as a kid in Michigan, had to wear them big, ugly boots when there was still slush on the ground, and all the kids at school would make fun of me. Ha, ha you still got to wear them rubber galoshes with all the buckles on the school when you walk down the hallway, ching, 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 ha, 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 you got to wear stupid boots. So I hit them in the bushes at the bus stop. It worked great for several days, until I came home and the neighbor cut all the bushes down. And the boots were gone. And I thought, uh-oh. I wonder if my mom knows. Because if you grew up in a house like us and you didn't have very much money, your name was written in everything. And I walked in the house and mom said, how was school today? Oh, I wonder if she knows anything. Good? Was there slush still on the street? She might know. She might know, but if I tell her now what I've done, I'll be in trouble for sure. So, a little. Were you glad you had your boots on at school? She couldn't know. Could she? See, now the story's over, and I know. What was she doing? Give me every opportunity to confess. And I said, yes. And she reached in that little room where when you grow up out north, you had a little room where you came in from the door, and you put all your coats and boots and all the nasty stuff in there, and she pulled out the boots and said, I wonder where these came from. Hey, Gehazi, where'd you go? Gehazi, you got one more chance. I didn't go anywhere. Then Elisha says to him, Gehazi, you think my spirit might already know? And Gehazi still stands there. Tragically, he has missed his last opportunity. Last one. Last one. And then he says, Gehazi, I 
already know. Now, now catch it out. I know that you went to meet Naaman. But the next verse shares with us, verse 26. And I want you to know that right now it's the very verse that God's speaking to your and my heart about right now. Because he says to Gehazi, I know where you went. And I know what was in your heart. I already know the plans you had for all of that silver. By the way, two loads of it an indication of what a great amount it was. I already know what you wanted in your heart. I am not a prophet. I am not Elisha. I don't know what's in your heart. But right now, God says, I know what's in your heart. And you've got one chance to deal with the pride, the coveting, the lying, and to be able to repent. Wow. I wonder what Gehazi's heart looked like right then. Well, I want to tell you. We know the problem with Naaman was he was a leper. And we know that God is going to punish Gehazi and give him leprosy. Full-blown leprosy. And in Gehazi's culture of Israel, it was as damning as anything could be to you. You weren't allowed in your house. If you had a job, you weren't allowed there. You could not go to worship. You had to tell people you were a leper so they didn't come close to you. Nearly impossible for your life to get worse. In 1979, I visited a leper colony in Costa Rica. We got to stand outside the fence. Some of those there had very mild cases of leprosy. Some of them had very severe cases of leprosy, and it was, for a few of them, very disgusting to look at. I couldn't imagine if on that day God said, go and give one of them a hug. I could never have done it. But I want you to know right now, when God looked at Gehazi's heart, he saw the leprosy of pride on it. He saw the leprosy of coveting on it. He saw the leprosy of lying on it. And when he looks at our heart today, if there are any of those things in there, you want to know what it looks like to God? Like leprosy. And of course, we know the result. Naaman cured. Gehazi given every opportunity to repent, and he doesn't. And God strikes him with leprosy. The tragic end to a story. One of the most poignant pictures 
of what yours and my heart really looks like. What will you look like when you stand before God? Will God welcome you to heaven because you've put your faith and trust in Christ? What is your heart as a child of God? What does it look like? Is there anybody you know that could say about you that you've been any less than truthful with them? Is there pride? Coveting? It's the opportunity to make it right. And the patience and long-suffering of God has given you this opportunity today. He won't make you do it, but he gives you that opportunity. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. You know what your heart looks like, and God knows what your heart looks like. I don't. And so if you're a child of God, it's time now to say, God, I need a clean heart. It may be the area of lying, it may be the area of pride, it may be the eye of coveting. Maybe in some other area, you know, God points it out to you. Maybe this morning you need to come to the altar just between you and God and say, God, give me a clean heart. I'm sorry. God, I confess it to you. Cleanse my heart. Maybe you're not sure of what God's going to say when you stand before him. You don't know you're going to spend eternity in heaven. I invite you to come this morning. So we have an opportunity for someone to sit down and take a few minutes of your time before you go today and share how you can know that you're a child of God. Maybe there's somebody you'd like to pray for this morning. You know our altar's always open for that. Father, I pray you'd bless our invitation time now. May we be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As our instrumentalist begins to play, our invitation is open. As a child of God, I invite you to come and say, God, cleanse my heart today. Cleanse it. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, I invite you to come. Give us an opportunity to talk to you about that before you go. Invitation's open. Come on. gave Gehazi so many opportunities you give us so many opportunities but eventually the last one comes thank you for your presence here today in Jesus name we pray Amen